So, as I've said, one of the primary purposes of functional safety assessments is to help us either identify and or correct systematic failure. So, the purpose is to look at the safety instrumented function, uh, sorry, system, to look at that in regards to the SRS to make sure that we're actually achieving functional safety. It needs to be independent and you can have one person or, or a team or hire a, hire a third party to come in and do it. And it should be, for, be performed after the following stages and must be done at least at stage three and four. Now, it's interesting when you read the standard. It sounds like it's just three and four that need to be done. But when you read this fine print, as it were, it says, whichever standard, oh sorry, whichever functional safety assessment you do, you have to make sure you can take into consideration the recommendations or any recommendations from the previous functional safety assessments performed. So if you haven't, for example, if you get to, to do FSA 3 as your first functional safety assessment and you haven't done 1 and 2, you're going to have to cover the requirements of 1 and 2 when you do 3. And remember, 3 is the one you do before you start up. So you really don't want to wait until that point to do your first functional safety assessment. Because if you find problems, number one, you're not supposed to start up. Now as an end user, you can take that decision to start up, but you would be assuming a lot of risk. Plus, if you're not self-insured, you need to make sure the insurance company is going to cover you if you have a potential incident. So it's important to do these and they're there for a reason they're not there just for the hell of it they're there for a reason so do the functional safety assessments it's very important and then functional safety assessment five <clears throat> is to make sure that after we've done a modification that we've properly assessed the ramifications of that change to make sure there's no impact on safety or no detrimental impact on safety and it's not going to affect what we've already got. Very important. So, functional safety assessment, do you really have what you need? That's the primary objective. Do we actually have what we need? And of course we want to try and identify potential problems before we get too far down the life cycle. <clears throat> So we have to define the assessment procedure which is appropriate to the SIL that we're looking at and the novelty of the design, appoint an experienced team leader and team of reviewers that are, again, competent to do this and create a plan for the review activities and their expected results. So we must make sure that we know what we expect to get and if we don't get what we expect, then what are the ramifications, what other decisions or actions do we need to fulfill? And if there are any specific safety bodies or certifications that we need, and then of course we conduct the assessment. <clears throat> so the key items are, in the analysis phase of course, have we done, if it's a HAZOP or if it's using even what-if analysis or checklist and what-if analysis, whatever methodology, FTD, fault tree, Whatever methodology we've used, have we identified our hazards correctly? Have we performed our layer of protection analysis and sill, sill target selection correctly? Now here's the other thing. I've heard it said, and I've heard it said at conferences, that we're so experienced doing PHAs we can, we can decide whether we need SIL2 or SIL1 or whatever. Well, here again. The life cycle has specific steps. You have, and it's sequential. So if you've determined that you have potential high severity consequences and likelihood, you need to do a layer of protection analysis. If you just jump over doing a layer of protection analysis and say, I need SIL2, what basis have you got to prove 
that it is SIL2 that you need in terms of the risk reduction. Because you don't, you won't have it. Expert opinion is not a valid technique according to 1511. You can use what if, you can use a checklist, you can use a combination of what if and checklist, you can use HAZOP, you can use FTD. But expert opinion, mm -mm, it's not in the standard. And like I said, I've been at conferences where I've heard these guys stand up and say that they've been doing HAZOPs for God knows how many years and they can easily determine whether it needs to be SIL1 or SIL2 without having to do LOPA. The problem with that is that you've got no evidence to support it. You haven't done your due diligence, you haven't done the layer of protection analysis. So we need to make sure we do that. The safety requirements specification needs to be properly defined and then we need to do the SIL design verification. <coughs> Equipment acceptance tests have to be done as well. And again, that would be part of doing either the on-site or the FAT. Operating testing and maintenance procedures need to be in place. That's very important. We have to make sure those are in place before we start up because we have to make sure that our O&M people are properly trained and understand what each of the SIFs is protecting against and for the maintenance guys, they need to know what are the startup requirements. Are there any bypassing requirements? Are there any inhibits or in, um, in terms of are there interlocks in there? What's the reset? How do we reset? All of this needs to be understood. So we need to make sure that the O&M procedures are in place before we start up and the O&M people are properly trained and then validation that the equipment meets the SRS. That's very important. That's why we do the startup safety review. Operational evidence of performance, that's our FSA4 that has to be conducted. Again, the standard says periodically, doesn't define what that period of time is, so you can determine how often you want to do it.